Book of Heaven, Volume 16, Part 14 May 19, 1924 All the acts of the one who lives in the divine will, from the littlest to the greatest, acquire the value of eternal and divine acts. My poor mind wandered in the immensity of the supreme volition. I felt as if I was inside a sea, and my whole being was drinking in large gulps the salutary water of the eternal will. Even more, it entered into me through all parts, through my ears, through my mouth, through my eyes, through my nostrils through the pores of my body. Now, while I was in this state, my sweet Jesus moved in my interior and told me, My daughter, my will is eternal, and only for the one who lives in it, embracing eternity, all of her acts, from the littlest to the greatest, being animated by an eternal will, all acquire the value, the merit, the form of divine and eternal acts. The divine volition empties those acts of all that is human, and filling them with its divine will, it makes them its own, and places its seal on them, constituting them as many eternal and divine acts. On hearing this, surprised, I said, How is it possible, O oh my highest good, that by just living in your will, the creature can receive this great good, that her acts become eternal and divine? And Jesus, why are you surprised? It is a most simple thing. The whole reason is that my will is eternal and divine and everything that comes from it, being a birth from an eternal and divine will, cannot be excluded from being eternal and divine, as long as the creature puts her human will aside to give place to mine. If she does so, her acts are counted among ours, both the great act and the littlest of them. And besides, the same happened in creation. How many things were not created, great and small, down to the little seed, the little insect? But as small as they may be, one cannot say that my great works were created by this supreme will, and therefore they are divine works, while the small ones were not created by a divine hand. And even though one can see that only everything that was created in the atmosphere, heavens, sun, stars, and so forth, is always fixed and stable, while that which was created on the low earth, flowers, plants, birds, and so forth, is subject to dying and being born again. This says nothing. On the contrary, because they were created by an eternal and divine will. The seed has the virtue of multiplying itself, because in all things there is my creating and preserving virtue. Now, if all created things, small or big, because they were created by virtue of my omnipotent fiat, can be called divine works, much more can one call divine and eternal the acts that my will works in the soul, who, placing her human will at the feet of my volition, gives me full freedom to let my will act. Ah, oh, if creatures could see a soul who lets my will live within herself, they would see astounding things never before seen. A god operating in the little circle of the human will. That is the greatest thing that can exist on earth and in heaven. 
the creation itself. Oh, how it would remain behind compared to the prodigies I keep working in this creature. May 24th, 1924. To doubt about the celestial doctrine of the divine will is the most absurd thing. The first word that God pronounced in creation was fiat. This word encloses everything, and with it, God gave the first lesson about his will. I was feeling embittered to the summit because of the privation of my sweet Jesus, and with the sad doubt that everything Jesus had told me and had worked in my soul was nothing other than an illusion of mine, a trick of the infernal enemy. I said to myself, if I were allowed, and if all the writings were in my hands and in my power, oh, how gladly I would burn them all up. But alas, they are no longer in my power. They are in someone else's hands. And if I wanted to, it would not be conceded to me. Ah, oh, Jesus, save my poor soul at least. Do not let me perish. And since everything is over, the relations between you and me, do not permit that I have the greatest of misfortunes of not doing, even slightly, your most holy and adorable will. Now, while I was thinking of this, my lovable Jesus moved in my interior. Before his adorable presence, the darkness fled, the doubts disappeared, and light and peace came back within me. And my sweet Jesus told me, Daughter of my will, why do you doubt about my work in you? And besides, to doubt about my will and about what I have told you on my supreme volition is the most absurd thing that can be. The doctrine of my will is more than crystal clear water drawn from limpid font of my divinity. It is more than refulgent sun that illuminates and warms. It is most clear mirror and whoever shall have the great good of being able to reflect himself in this celestial and divine doctrine shall be stirred and shall feel within himself all the goodwill to be purified of his stains, so as to be able to drink in large gulps from this celestial doctrine, and therefore be embellished by divine adornments you must know the cause, the reason why the divine wisdom and omnipotence wanted to pronounce the fiat in creation. He could have created all things without saying a word, but since he wanted his will to hover over all things and for all things to receive the virtue and the goods it contains, he pronounced the fiat. And as he pronounced it, he communicated the prodigies of his will so that all things might have my will as life, as regime, as example, and as teacher. Great, my daughter, was the first word of your God that resounded in the vault of the heavens. It was the fiat, nor did he say anything else. This meant that everything was in the fiat. With the fiat, I created everything. I constituted everything. I ordered everything. I enclosed everything. 
I bound all of its goods for the benefit of all those who would not go out of my eternal fiat. And when, after I created everything, I wanted to create man, I did nothing but repeat the fiat, as though needing him with my own will. And then I added, let us make man in our image and likeness. By virtue of our will, he shall maintain our likeness whole within himself, and shall preserve our image beautiful and intact. See then how the uncreated wisdom, as if unable to say anything else but fiat, wanted to pronounce it. So necessary was this lesson, so sublime for all. And this fiat is still hovering over the whole creation as the preserver of my own works, and as though in act of descending upon earth, to invest man, to enclose him once again within itself, so that he may return there where he came from, that is, having come out of my will, into my will he may return. In fact, it is my will that all things created by me return along the same path from which they came, so that they may come back to me beautiful, decorous, and as though carried in triumph by my very will. So everything I have told you about my will had this as my purpose, that my will be known and come to reign upon earth, and what I have said shall be I shall overwhelm everything in order to obtain this, but everything must return to me within that word, fiat. Fiat did God say, and fiat must man say. In all his things he shall have nothing but the echo of my fiat, the mark of my fiat, the works of my fiat, so that I may give the goods that my will contains. In this way, I shall fulfill the complete purpose of all creation. And this is why I have set about the work of making known the effects, the value, the goods, the sublime things that my will contains, and how the soul tracing the same path as my fiat, shall become so sublimated, divinized, sanctified, enriched, as to make heaven and earth astonished at the sight of the portent of my fiat operating in the creature. In fact, by virtue of my will, new graces that I had never issued before light more refulgent, portents unheard of and never before seen, shall come out of me. I act like a teacher when he teaches the sciences he knows to his disciple. If he teaches his disciple, it is because he wants to make of him another teacher like himself. So I do. If my sublime lesson was my first word, fiat, and the prayer I taught was the fiat on earth as it is in heaven, now, as I have moved forward to give you more extensive, more clear, more sublime lessons about my will, it is because I want the disciple not only to acquire science of my will, but becoming himself a teacher, to teach it to others. And not only this, but to acquire my properties and my goods, my joys and my own happiness. 
Therefore, be attentive and faithful to my teachings, and never move from my will. May 29, 1924, the pain of the apostles when they saw Jesus ascend into heaven. The good that this pain produced. Lesson to Louisa about the pain of the privation of Jesus. I was thinking of when my sweet Jesus went back to heaven in his glorious ascension and therefore of the sorrow of the apostles in remaining without such a great good. And my sweet Jesus, moving in my interior, told me, My daughter, the greatest sorrow for all of the apostles in their entire lives was to remain without their master. As they saw me ascend to heaven, their hearts were consumed with the pain of my privation, and much more was this pain sharp and penetrating, since it was not a human pain, something material that they were losing, but a divine pain. It was a God that they were losing. And even though I had my humanity, has it resurrected? It was spiritualized and glorified. And therefore all the pain was in their souls and penetrating their whole beings. It caused them to feel all consumed with grief to the point of forming in them the most harrowing and painful martyrdom. But all this was necessary for them. It can be said that until that moment, they were nothing but tender babies in virtues and in the knowledge of divine things and of my very person. I could say that I was in their midst, but they did not really know me nor love me. But when they saw me ascend into heaven, the pain of losing me tore the veil and they recognized me with such certainty as the true Son of God that the intense sorrow of no longer seeing me in their midst gave birth to firmness in good and strength to suffer anything for love of him whom they had lost. It gave birth to the light of divine science it removed from them the swaddling clothes of their infancy, and it formed them as intrepid men, no longer fearful, but courageous. The pain transformed them and formed in them the true character of apostles. What they could not obtain with my presence they obtained with the pain of my privation. Now, my daughter, a little lesson for you. Your life can be called a continuous pain of losing me and a continuous joy of acquiring me. But between the pain of the loss and the joy of acquiring me, how many surprises have I not given you? How many things have I not told you? It was pain and the painful martyrdom of losing me that prepared you and disposed you to hear the sublime lessons on my will. In fact, how many times it seemed to you that you had lost me. And while you were immersed in your harrowing pain, I would come back to you with one of the most beautiful lessons on my will and I would make the new joy of acquiring me come back to dispose you once again to the piercing pain of my absence. I can say that the pain of remaining without me has given birth in you to the effects, the value, the knowledges, 
the foundation of my will. It was necessary that I conduct myself with you in this way, that is, coming to you very often and leaving you prey to the pain of being without me. Since I had established that I would manifest to you, in a way all special, many things about my will, I had to leave you prey to a continuous divine pain, because my will is divine, and only upon a divine pain could it establish its throne and lay its dominion. And assuming the attitude of teacher, it communicated the knowledge of my will as much as it is possible for a creature. Many shall marvel in hearing of the continuous visits I made to you that I have not done with others, and of your continuous pain of my privation. Had you not seen me so many times, you would not have known me, nor loved me so much, because each one of my visits brings an additional knowledge of me, and a new love. And the more the soul knows me, and loves me, the more her pain is redoubled. And I, in coming, kept provoking your pain more intensely, because I want my will not to lack the noble cortege of pain that constitutes the soul firm and strong, so that my will may form my stable dwelling in her and give her new and continuous lessons on my will. Therefore I repeat to you, let me do, and trust me. June 1, 1924 The great good produced by remembering everything that Jesus did, suffered, and said in his life. This morning I found myself outside of myself, and I saw my last late confessor. The footnote says, Father Gennaro de Gennaro. Surrounded by many people who were all attentive and as though enraptured in listening to him. And he spoke and spoke and became so inflamed as to inflame the others. I drew near to hear what he was saying, and to my surprise I heard that he was saying all that my blessed Jesus had told me. His finesses of love, the many condescensions of Jesus toward me. And when he spoke of the stratagems of love of Jesus toward me, he radiated light to the point of remaining transfused within that light. And not only himself, but also those who were listening to him. I remained surprised, and I said to myself, The confessor has done this not only in life, telling the things of my soul to others, but he is doing it also after his death, in the next life. And I was waiting for him to finish speaking, so as to be able to approach him and tell him of some difficulty of mine. But he would not finish, and I found myself inside myself. And then, according to my usual way, I followed my beloved Jesus in his passion, compassionating him, repairing him, and making his pains my own. And Jesus, moving in my interior, told me, My daughter, how much great good does the memory of me and of everything I did, suffered, and said in my life procure for the soul by compassionating me 
and making my intentions her own, and by remembering one by one my pains, my works, my words. She calls them into herself and places them in neat order within her soul in such a way as to come to take the fruits of what I did, suffered, and said. This produces a sort of divine humidness within the soul, over which the sun of my grace delights in rising and in forming celestial dew by virtue of that humidity. Not only does this dew embellish the soul in a marvelous way, but it has the virtue of mitigating the rays of the burning sun of my divine justice when finding souls burned by the fire of sin, it is about to strike them, burn them, and wither them more. Tempering its rays, this divine dew uses them to form beneficial dew so that creatures may not be struck. And it constitutes itself vital humidity so as not to let them wither. Oh, how this symbolizes nature, when after a day of scorching sun, the plants are about to wither. A humid night is enough, and rising again over that humidity, the sun forms its dew, and instead of making them perish, its heat serves to fecundate them and to bring to completion the maturation of their fruits. The same happens in a more marvelous way in the supernatural order. The memory is the beginning of a good. The memory forms many sips for the soul in order to give her life. When some good when things are forgotten, they lose their vital virtue for the soul. They lose their attractiveness, the gratitude, the correspondence, the esteem, the love, the value. And not only does this memory produce the origin of every good in life, but after one's death also it produces the origin of glory. Have you not heard your late confessor? How he delighted in speaking about the graces I have given you? This is because during his life he cared about hearing them. He remembered them, and his interior remained filled with them to the point of overflowing outside. And now, how much good did this not procure for him in the next life? It is for him like a font of good that overflows for the good of others. So, the more the soul remembers what belongs to me, my graces, the lessons I have given her, the more the font of my goods grows within her, to the point that, Unable to contain them, they overflow for the good of others. June 6, 1924 Louisa must cover the ways of all creatures and enclose all that the divine will contains in order to be the starting point of the fiat voluntas tua on earth as it is in heaven. The one who must give everything must enclose everything. I was in the midst of my usual and hard pains of his privation. I feel I am under the lash of a justice that punishes me with such great rigor, with not even a shadow of pity. O oh, punishing justice of God, how terrible you are! But you are even more terrible when you hide from the one who loves you. 
your arrows would be sweeter to me if while you punish me even tearing me to pieces my jesus were with me oh how i cry over my lot even more i would want heaven and earth everyone to cry with me over the lot of the poor exiled one who not only lives far away from her fatherland but is also left by her jesus who was her only comfort the only support of her long exile now while my poor heart was swimming in the bitterness of its pain my adorable jesus made himself seen in my interior an act of dominating everything he was holding as though many reins in his hands and each rein was linked to a human heart so there were as many reins in his hands for as many existing creatures and then he said to me my daughter the way is long even more each life of creature is a distinct way therefore it is necessary to walk much and along many ways you shall be the one who shall cover all these ways because since i must enclose my will in you you must enclose all that it contains and it befits you with my will to cover all ways together of each creature Therefore, in my will, you have much to do and suffer. On hearing this, oppressed and tired as I was, I said, My Jesus, this is too much. Who can do them? I am already tired enough. And besides, you leave me alone. And without you, I can do nothing. Oh, if I had you always with me, then I could do them. But alas, you leave me alone and I can do nothing. And Jesus added, Yet I am in your heart, guiding everything, and all these ways were covered by me. I enclosed everything. I let not even one heartbeat or pain of one creature escape me. And you must know that, having to enclose my will in you as center of life, it is necessary that my supreme volition find in you all the ways and all that your Jesus did, because they are inseparable from it. It is enough not to accept one thing alone that it contains to prevent it from forming its center, from having its full dominion, and from having its starting point in you, so as to make itself known and to dominate others. It would have it from itself, but not from you. See then how necessary it is that you embrace everyone and cover the ways of all, taking upon yourself the hardships, pains, and acts of all, if you want the majesty of my will to descend into you, to follow its course within you. On hearing this, surprised, I said, My love, what are you saying? You know how poor I am, and in what state I find myself. And besides, how can I enclose the whole of your will? At the most, with your grace, I can do your will. I can live in it. But to enclose it is impossible. I am too little, and I cannot contain an unending will. And Jesus my daughter, it shows you do not want to understand it. He who wants to enclose this will in you must give you the grace and the capacity in order to contain it. 
Did I perhaps not enclose my whole being in the womb of my celestial mamma? Is it perhaps that I enclosed myself in part, leaving part of myself in heaven? Certainly not. And by my enclosing myself in her womb, was she not the first one who took part in all the acts of her creator, in all the pains, identifying herself with me so as to omit nothing of what I did? Was she not my starting point from which I came out to give myself to the other creatures? If I did this with my inseparable mamma in order to descend to man and fulfill my redemption, can I not do it with another creature, giving her the grace and capacity to enclose my will, making her take part in all the acts it contains, so as to form its life and come out as though from a second mother to come into the midst of creatures? to make myself known and fulfill the fiat voluntas tua on earth as it is in heaven? Do you not want then to be the starting point of my will? But oh, how much it cost my queen mother to be the starting point of my appearance upon earth. So shall the starting point of my will cost you that it may make its appearance in the midst of creatures. The one who must give everything must enclose everything. One cannot give but what one possesses. Therefore, my daughter, do not take lightly what regards my will and what is befitting for you to do so that it may form its life in you. It is the thing that interests me the most, and you must be attentive in order to follow my teachings. Deo gratias, and may he who uses so much goodness with the least of his creatures be always blessed. You have reached the end of the Book of Heaven, Volume 16. Fiat.